Podo. Welcome to the Ned Lard Radio Hour. I'm Nick Hilton. Thanks for listening. Welcome. You've got mail. I was one of those work-from-home radicals, those pioneers of our new digitised landscape before it was cool, or, you know, mandated by the government. I just spent a couple of years in an office job, which I largely enjoyed, but had become increasingly convinced was wasting too much of my time. Each day I'd arrive at work and try and expand my work to fill the time that I knew I had to be there. I felt incentivized to drag out minor tasks or take increasingly long lunch breaks because there was nothing enjoyable that I could do with those moments during the workday when I had no real work to do. My decision to embark on the adventure of self-employment was in part because I felt like it would allow me to manage my own time, to walk the dog in the middle of the day, which is Trust me, the best time to walk the dog, if I so desired. I could have a bath in the afternoon or work from the spare room at my in-laws if we wanted to get out of London. In short, I felt like it would make the time that I was wasting more productive. Shortly before the start of COVID, I came to the realisation that I wasn't really into the work-from-home lifestyle. I was finding myself bored in a whole new set of ways. Lack of stimulation, lack of social interaction, lack of chance meetings at the water cooler. Now I was spending too much time trying to explain spreadsheets to my dog. It didn't feel that healthy. But COVID came along and rocked my business like a boat in a storm and rendered the possibility of moving towards an office working lifestyle moot for the time being. Fast forward to the present day and I'm writing this in the office at the top of my house where I also do my recordings. This is still work from home, you'll note. But I do have an office space in central London where I sometimes go, not nearly often enough for my accountant's liking, and where I can, occasionally, interact with other team members. But I'm just one tiny fly in the great swarm of people who have evolved into a more dynamic, more hybridised, if that's a word, form of work. Look, let's get real. If you're a bricklayer or a pilot or a veterinary nurse or a paediatric orthodontist or the pest control guy who delicately places pieces of cheese in mousetraps, there hasn't been a work-from-home revolution. The revolution, in so much as there has been one, has been in the information services sector, an area that probably overhired, overinvested in real estate and was probably desperate to slash both those costs. But if you're a professional in one of these industries, I'm sure you've noticed a very real change in the world of work. Work from home and hybrid working has gone from the strange preserve of senior executives and recent relocators to an almost default presumption. Research in 2021 by IWG found that 85% of 18 to 24 year olds would take flexible working as a perk ahead of a 10% salary bump. A 2023 survey of possible business perks found that 94% of people felt that work from home would improve their well-being, making it the most desired perk. What were the other top perks, I hear you ask? In second place, flexi hours. In bronze medal, flexi location. All of these beat out number one, a bonus check. So even though I'm stuck here in my attic with the portrait of me that is aging at an astonishing rate, wondering about how I can get back into a more rigid set of work structures, most young people feel very differently. And even as big businesses and banks and finance corporations and tech firms or whatever, try and force workers back into the office, a quiet rebellion is going on amongst Gen Zers or Gen Zers, for my American listeners. What will win out in the end? The interests of the capitalist elite or the insurgent professional generation pushing their new work ideology? Here's what Ned had to say on the matter when I emailed them about this. Self-deceit in Silicon Valley might encourage business leaders in the belief that they can renege on the ambitious promise of the past few years, but the work world of the 21st century will scarcely resemble that of the previous century. It will be pan-global and fluid, turning homes into offices and offices into homes. The one consistent in this will be the digital realm, a radical new space for business. How we approach that is the question. Do we try and replicate the manifest deficiencies of present working culture for the sake of continuity? 
Do we try and reinvent the very notion of work to appease changing priorities? Or is there a Goldilocks solution? Because the risk, the ultimate risk of all this, is that there is no longer a discrete place in which to be an independent, unyoked human. Got right, desegregated work is an opportunity. Got wrong, it is another burden to bear. Now, I think I'm instinctively less bullish on the possibilities of hybrid work than Ned, which seems to me to erode an already feebly drawn line between work, on one hand, and play, on the other. But I happened upon a business called Ashore and found it an interesting premise. It is essentially a way of making remote work more appealing to the human instinct. They market a bunch of properties set up for remote working, but which are set in beautiful landscapes or interesting parts of the world. They see it as a way, I think, of breaking out of the home and office binary and offering a third space, a workspace that encourages humans to be humans rather than, you know, pure working drones. Anyway, I wanted to get the company's co-founder, Alad McLean-Jones, on to discuss his journey to Ashore, what they're trying to build there, and how he views the work-from-home revolution. He's a really interesting, clear thinker, so do stick around now to hear what he thinks. Okay, I am in a uh, in my apartment in Maida Vale, and it is twenty to four. Okay, lovely. Well, same same here. Although I'm not in your apartment in Maida Vale, but Alan, you're the founder of a company called Ashore. It's a business that's very much at the cutting edge of the conversation about the way we work. Um, before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of what the company is, can you talk about the journey that brought you to launching Ashore, I guess it it launched shortly after the the kind of resolution or what felt like the resolution of the pandemic, but kind of you've had a kind of bit of a career progression to get there. Can you talk me through the the journey back ashore? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I've definitely had like quite a sort of squiggly career. So um, I did law at university and I spent uh, about five years as kind of a barrister doing media law. So the kind of Harry and Meghan style stuff for and against Mm -hmm. um, newspapers um, and then in March 2020, I was kind of asked to go in um, uh, to Treasury as a special advisor um, during COVID. So I did that for basically two years um, and sort of ca- and was reshuffled over to the cabinet office for a few months towards the end. Um, but alongside that, the big thing that um, me and my kind of wife had spent a lot of time doing was traveling around the UK. So like visiting different bits of it and sort of. I had jobs that were always on and I was always like very tempted to kind of have my cake and eat it. Um, and so at the, basically at the beginning of sort of 20, of 2022, I decided where our first child was born, I decided to kind of leave government and sort of explore this space and particularly around, you know, this trend of people kind of being able to kind of, um, to work any, you know, work anywhere. Um, and the kind of flexibility that come from the pandemic and sort of seeing, you know where that went and where that journey might take us. And when you were working as a as a lawyer and then in the, the treasury and the civil service, presumably those are two kind of inflexible industries, industries that wanted to get people back into the office as quickly as possible. You know, actually much more rigid structurally. So was it was this a kind of rebellion? We'll come on to what actually Ashore is. I'm conscious of, but was this a sort of rebellion against the um, what you'd experience in your working career? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, maybe a little bit, I think. I mean, so the first job I did as a lawyer, that was, there was quite a lot of flexibility there as a barrister, because you're sort of, you're in this little chambers, you know, that's on normally off Fleet Street or somewhere nearby. And then you're able to kind of like, you know, you do spend a lot of time in different places. And I'm interested in what that looks like now. Like, anecdotally, it feels like a lot of people there are taking example, like take, are still taking quite heavy advantage of the flexibilities. Um, but yeah, certainly in, um, in government and like, particularly if you're on the political side, you know, it's, it's very much kind of, uh, you know, it's very much kind of like you are, you know, you're forced to kind of a very strict routine, not because of like, you know, that you want to, but because you're just constantly being reactive to events, right? And I do feel like, maybe one, you know, feeling that I had whilst I was in government that I was rebelling a bit against was that I was constantly being reactive. You know what I mean? I was never trying to deal with a problem for more than two hours and Mm -hmm. the ability to like get away and like have the time to do some like strategic and creative thinking, like the closest I could get to that was like walking around Regent's Park, uh, sorry, St. James's Park, you know? Um, So I definitely felt like I was missing that. So maybe there is like a sense of rebellion in it. Yeah. 
Okay, so th- then that brings us to Ashore. So give me the sort of elevator pitch for what Ashore is. Yeah, sure. So um, Ashore is a platform that basically lets uh, businesses, managers and employees book stays in homes that are kind of designed for kind of creative and productive work. So often you'll be in kind of like a hybrid organisation or a remote first organisation um, and you'll generally be working out of like your kind of home office or um, or maybe, you know, going to the office a few days a week. Like we're big believers in the fact that you know, like going somewhere new, disrupting your routine is like a really great way to kind of uh, unleash kind of creativity and productivity. And so what we do is we let people or, you know, couples or like small teams go away in our homes and they basically use them to kind of, you know, work on basically whatever they're working on. And our kind of bet is that, you know, that helps unlock something within our users because, you know, when you're away, you're in a different place, work feels like slightly different to how it you, you know normally does. So, so who is your customer base here? Are you an agent for people who want to market their properties as staycation people, or are you are you a broker for people who are looking for staycations? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're sort of like a marketplace model. So we spend a fair bit of time thinking about both sides of the both sides of the marketplace. You know, so on the um, on the kind of supply side. So generally, so we don't own the homes. So these are these are people across the UK. Whether it's kind of like you know, a farmer that's converted their stables or it's like an artist in Hay on Wye who, you know, is interested in like, um, in like using, using, you know, a, a space for something else. Um, and so they're kind of across the UK. I think generally our users, um, they work in like tech or professional services. They're generally based in a city. So, you know, they're not really nomads. They're quite sticky. They've normally got something sticking them to a city. And our three main cities are um, London, uh, Bristol and Edinburgh. And they'll work, you know, they could be like a product manager, at like a tech company, they could be the founder of a startup, or they could be like a lawyer, at, you know, at a kind of law firm. But what they really want is just the chance to escape for a couple of days and, you know, step mm. away from the everyday and focus on something new. And are you mainly selling this direct to consumer or are you, are you pitching this to organisations that want to, you know, send half a dozen team members more away for a little bit, sort of a, a sort of a glorified corporate away day, sort of perk sort of thing? Presumably that's where the scale is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things where we started with, you know, consumer facing thing. And if I think about our first users, they were very much, you know, people themselves who were doing it off their own bat or like freelancers. Um, but what we found, it's interesting, really. I mean, when I started it, I was kind of quite agnostic about what it would look like. Um, but I mean, the two things we discovered very early on, the first was that when people were going away to these places, they were like, they were going away to work and they were being like, incredibly productive and I I hadn't really expected that and that was like a very good thing and that was also what was bringing people back and then secondly yeah companies kind of getting interested in it because I think a lot of companies feel like yeah they haven't quite got it right you know like the current kind of like whether it's kind of like remote or hybrid that current there's just there's something where they're just not getting like a hundred percent out of their people like it's almost like you know, the pandemic happened, it changed people's expectations about flexibility. But we we aren't yet in a stage where like, new rhythms have kind of been developed, you know, it's sort of, you know, it's a bit like Gramsci, isn't it? You know, the kind of the kind of, you know, the sort of old is dead, but the new is yet to be unborn. And so, yeah, we, you know, we do a lot with kind of small companies. And I think for us, a big priority this year is expanding that out as well. And, um, and, and, you know, if I think about some of the larger companies that a lot of our users work for kind of building relationships with them. Do you get a sense of the rough direction of of traffic in, in terms of whether people are going to be coming more back into the office? You know, obviously, we had this situation immediately post pandemic, where companies were still tied into big real estate leases and wanted to push people back into the office to kind of like justify that investment. We're almost now out of that cycle in that a lot of companies have scaled down their office space investment have tried to cut back on that, have introduced a more hybrid model, codified it into their way of doing business. Do you get a sense of where this the dust is going to settle or is it just waiting for the next black swan event to come along and change everything? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, I agree with that. I think that really is right. I think, you know, what I what we saw, I think, directly after the, the you know, ultimately the, the one, th- there's one major thing that we've seen, which is that that flexible expectation is here to stay, right? So, you know, people generally, when you ask them now, they value the ability to work flexibly as much as like an 8% pay rise. In some Mm -hmm. sectors, it goes up to 20%. Um, And, you know, we've had like so many kind of 
grand exhortations from you know various kind of newspapers and stuff like okay th- this this time we're going to be back to the office full time and I think that hasn't really been seen to um to play out and that kind of original I think right in the wake of the pandemic you had these two kind of positions one was like we're all going to go remote like offices are a waste of time cities are a waste of time let's all just go and live in like you know, Starlinks, RV vans, and kind of connect up via you know, vi- vi- you know, Apple Vision Pros. Oh, and then, nice. and like, yeah, that does sound nice. Yeah, that's yeah. As I was saying that, I was kind of like, yeah, I'm pretty into that. And then the second thing is like, we're you know, this is a blip, and we're, it's going to revert right back to kind of five days. I think now we're in the grey area, right? For every company, it's like a hybrid. Um, of, and it, the the debate now is in some ways much more boring, where it's about shades of hybrid, but. In other ways, it's more interesting because I think once you accept that, you know, the concept of the office kind of bec- like the, tr- the traditional, like unspecialized five day a week office becomes like, hang on, why why do we have that? What are like some more interesting ways for us to like organize ourselves when it comes to place and location? What you talk about expectation is really interesting. And, and I guess part of the issue that's made this such a gray area to have conversations about is that you can basically present from a productivity perspective one argument in favour of work from home and flexible working and another argument in favour of office working. And no one's quite really been able to create a metric that's very empirical in terms of like settling that debate. It feels like it's a very much a sort of whatever your ethos is, it kind of guides how you where you end up there, facts and alternative facts. So I guess may- maybe you talk about productivity in your pitch, sales pitch too, but are you also talking about sort of a sense of well-being? Because both work from home and work from office come with commensurate downsides in terms of ge- general mental health, I would say. They both have obvious drawbacks. Is this maybe more of an antidote to the well-being perspective than the productivity perspective? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think it's, it's something that we like we see quite a lot, right? I think particularly that like people want to have a slightly different relationship between their work and their life, right? And I always think about... Um, maybe the relationship that like very successful and very like, you know, like sort of, you know, like very wealthy people had with their work where it kind of like, it sort of followed them around. Right. And so, you know, you always think about like in succession when it's like, you know, the turn to a wedding where they make sure they have like a room for a meeting, right. Or whatever, because the idea of kind of, they're always traveling because their work kind of travels with them. Right. And I do think that like what we've seen is a lot more people who are kind of like, I want to have like that, very different kind of relationship with my work whether it's about you know when I work right so in terms of like okay I want to spend more time with my family and so on and so forth so I want to be able to kind of work in different at different hours whether it comes to location you know and obviously that's kind of where we we come in in a major way and so I do think that like that kind of like classic like industrial revolution kind of like approach of thinking about work where it's kind of like you have like well, you know, so it's almost kept, sort of was refined and kind of came out of the 1940s and stuff. The idea of you have a certain number of hours in a, you know, a location, you have to commute to that location and um, people just don't want that anymore. And I think they, even if they still have to do it, they also see other people around them doing it, right? They see, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, I think that's a big problem. If you're saying like somewhere where you have to go in five days a week, you see your friend who's, you know, having a much better quality of living because of, flex- because of the flexibility. So I think once you have that expectation, which is there, I think definitely like there's a big well-being element. You know, it's just more painful once you know there's an alternative, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I guess full disclosure here that despite being a um, work from home, a predominantly work from home person, I mean, I do have an office. I just don't, I don't ever really go into it. Dread to think what the uh, the the pot plant is how it's doing. I think it was before Christmas <laughs> that I was last in. But you know, despite being a predominantly work from home person, I, I think I am a general supporter of office working because I think that especially for younger people the delineation of you know work and life work and play is so important and it's so hard it's very easy for kind of like executives who have you know nice houses in leafy suburban parts of London with their own you know study and space to work in to say okay it's great to be work from home but the the reality is that the boundaries become blurry and I guess Ashore is is kind of plugged into those, those boundaries too because what you're creating is a product that's sort of half holiday in the sense that it involves you know traveling somewhere somewhere beautiful a nice stay in somewhere but it also is a work thing I mean the closest thing I guess historically has been the sort of idea of like a writer's retreat somewhere you can break the the cycle of daily monotony 
Are you guys just collaborating in the further erosion of the kind of work-life balance? Yeah, you know, I think it's like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm basically with you on, a, on certainly on the, like, I'm someone who, you know, personally thinks that there is still like a role for the office, right? And I think that I do, it, it, it was interesting very early on when we had our first kind of calls businesses, like that was a very th- big thing that CEOs particularly were mindful of, which is like, I've got this amazing setup in my, yeah, in my place in Isha. Um, but like, if you think about like what the, you know, and, and if, if you think about it in terms of both the fact that like rent is so expensive as well, right? And so you have a lot of young people who basically are forced into kind of, you know, going towards cities where the rents are higher, but only, but you, they don't have the promise of the kind of five day a week, you know, office drinks, all that sort of stuff, so on and so forth. It's much more like a kind of, well, you're, you're going here, you're you're locating yourself here because, you know, you ultimately, um, because you ultimately, you know, like we want you to do so, but you're, um, but yeah, you're stuck in like a substandard home, you know, and I think a lot of it as well is like the way our homes are constructed, you know, I think that one of the th- reasons, one of the areas where we play, you know, so we kind of have in every home, you know, we sort of make sure they're set up for work as well as they are for living in right and Mm -hmm. i think that's a big problem is like um you know is that it's a take your average roman home you know it was almost like you walk in and you go left to the office bit and go right to the to the kind of like chilling bit right and then because everybody was working in factories or in offices homes you know that were built in the sort of 20th century didn't need to have like offices and so on so forth and so where i think the work-life balance really erodes is where you don't have you know, places with those specific spaces, like certainly, you know, we've got two kids, we have one office, right, in our flat in London, you know what I mean? There's like always a bit of bit of tussling about that, right? And it's never, particularly when you've got children, it's never good to like, be trying to do a Zoom call, and you've got like two kids running behind you, and so on, and so forth, right? And um, so yeah, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think what we're trying to do is kind of like, at the moment, you have this very negative blending of work and life often where people want to do it, but they just don't have the tools. And I think we see Ashore as like a way of like, of like, of, of, you know, providing people those tools that means that they can, can blend it in a really good way where, you know, for some of the, you know, the morning they might go surfing, then they can sort of close themselves in like a specialized office. They can do great work. They're not worrying about the internet. They're not like feeling judged because of their Zoom background. Um, and then they're back to it with their families in the evening. So it's kind of like, yeah, you know, trying to blend the both, but doing it better. Yeah, it's, it kind of speaks to that difficulty in measuring the kind of quality of people's work time. And I think, and I think, you know, the clocking in, clocking out culture that was, you know, a big thing in like factory work and, and, and even office culture kind of historically, I guess that during the pandemic, that became a whole thing of like remote work too. You wanted to be seen on Slack at, you know, 8am. And then you wanted to make sure you sent your last email sort of 9.30pm to make sure that you've done a nice long day when the reality is we'd all be better if we spent you know, three hours surfing in the morning and then just did all our work in a consolidated time period in the afternoon. But it's very, it's just very hard to measure that. Yeah, totally. I always remember when I was at, you know, university, like, and you had, I remember that um, uh, there were some students in like, um, in like one of the kind of, and, and they'd always be underperforming. And the reason was because they would like, they would socialize and they, they would work collectively, right? They would work together. So they'd go to someone's room every day and they would like, all six of them would walk around, you know, and they would like sit there and just revise and work together. And because they were trying to like blend their like personal time with their work time in a way that was, just, you know, they just got the worst of both worlds, right? So I think a, a big good exam question for us is like, yeah, you know, can you turn what is like, what should be like, what some people feel is like a defensive, you know what I mean? Like, how am I going to be able to, go somewhere new with my team and make sure that we're like performing, you know, turning it all the way to the other way, which is like, like an artist retreat, as you say, where, okay, I'm going away and I know I'm going to be even more productive. Yeah. So I, I kind of get where, where the product works in terms of if I were running Goldman Sachs, you know, brilliant. It's a lovely thing to be able to offer your staff a week a year to go off and work from a beautiful place. If I'm a, a kind of burnt out freelance UX designer who earns, you know, Thirty thousand pounds a year, and I just really, you know, I'm living in London. We've got housemates. I want to get, you know, get away for a bit. Is this a product that you think could work for someone like that, or is it that they have to go on Airbnb and spend half their, you know, savings on, you know, spending a spending a week in Newcastle? Is it at that level? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I think for us, like, it's important to like, um, yeah, to be able to play at every level, right? Because I think if I were to think about a lot of our 
users to begin with like a lot of them were freelancers right and like you know freelance designers um or like yeah you know or like content creators as well like so like sub stackers and so on and so forth right and like for us it's, it's like a kind of a big part of the mission right and so being able to make sure that you know um like a short stays you know a kind of like you know that we've got the tax situation bottomed out right so they're kind of you know so that you know they could they you know they could be like deductible and so on and so forth so it is very important for us because like you know, and I also like if you think structurally where the where the mark, you know, where the labor market is going, and like the disruption that's coming from AI as well, right? Like, you know, our view is that, like, my view anyway is that you know we need to be leaning into like leaning more into kind of like creativity, not less, right? And so the, anything we can do to give that to give people an unfair advantage, like we're so up for it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess that that putting the humanity back in technology is something that you know, I think is a good, is a good hedge bet on where the future is going. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. I think like it's, that's for me, like it's, that's one of the big trends, right? I mean, if you look at like, even some of the, you know, if you look at the pace of change around things like, obviously, you know, we talk about chat GPT, but also kind of when it comes to image and video and so on and so forth, you know, like that's very quickly going to flood the internet, right? And we're just going to have like an algorithmically generated internet. And so at that point, you know, I think we're going to want, you know, like the human touch right is going to become more and more important and so yeah like you know trying to help people kind of like continue trying to help people who are kind of using using tech as tools um you know like as much as possible rather than kind of like i think taking another view like another philosophical view that lots of people have which is kind of like oh you know well you know like this tech is going to be good enough to replace those people you know what i mean and like i think placing us firmly on the side of the like like tech romantics, you know, people who kind of think about the idea of, um, of yeah, you know, of like, you know, so it goes back to the Steve Jobs idea of the kind of bicycle of the mind, isn't it? You know what I mean? For the computer, that original vision of like, you know, a sort of slightly 80s kind of, you know, sort of hippie kind of thing where you have the kind of machine and man working in harmony mm. rather than kind of like something that looks a bit more like the Matrix, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's also good because you've got a got a company there that um, your investors can be relatively relatively sure that uh, you know AI unleashed the next iteration of AI unleashed is not going to be able to create a perfect facsimile because you know I don't think AI are going to break out and start renting out properties or you know creating beautiful vistas for people to work against you know that that tactility the 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 realness of the product that you're ultimately selling now they may be able to gazump you in the marketplace but um, but at least at its roots there's something real to play with yeah totally yeah you know and i think it comes to like a philosophical difference between like us and ai where you know as humans we're like embodied right and so the physicality matters to us in a way that it doesn't to uh, you know to like whatever intelligence might come come out of like you know whatever chat gpt like you know version six looks like right and i think that um yeah you know it's it's an interesting like your four question isn't it? you know like does as as like this as the kind of as you know, screens get better and better, right? Do we end up in a kind of like ready player one style world where like, well, the physical world doesn't matter anymore. We can just let it kind of, you know, fall apart because we're all just completely online all the time. Um, or do you want to kind of like pick up a shovel and kind of, you know, and, and defend, you know, the importance of like place and space and like the physical world. And I think we're very much like on that side of the, on that side of the line. Mm. Okay, two final questions. Firstly, where are you now in terms of this project? Like, you know, it's only been, um, I don't know when you founded it. I was listening when you said earlier, but I, 2021, something like that, 2022? Uh, yeah, basically. So I've been working, kind of, in the early days, it was just me on my own with like a Squarespace page, like just talking to people um, with three homes. And then we've basically been running at it for a year now as a kind of team. So I think our like official shore anniversary is like, in, in February, on February the second, so we're just- Oh, you can go on, a, go on a team retreat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We should, we should be like, yeah, dog fooding our own- uh, um, so yeah, it's been going for um, going for about a year. And um, what's the sort of scale you're at now? Yeah, sure. So at the moment we're kind of um, so we have like 30 homes across the UK, so a really nice level of uh, of coverage in the UK. I think you know for us, right? I think you know the the, the big vision, the big picture is to kind of um, you know you know really really go as big as we can because you know a, a world in which no matter where you are, you're like less than like you know, a couple of, like, a couple of minutes away from somewhere where you're able to, like, do really great work, you know what I mean? Like, so wherever inspiration strikes, you're ready to kind of be able to capture it as a, that, like, feels to me like a good world. 
Um, mm. So, you know, for us, I think our plan now is just to kind of keep on, uh, you know, keep, yeah, just, just sort of just keep, keep on focusing in the UK and then I think see where things kind of take us next, basically. But, um, but yeah. Sorry, this is, I, I'm having an extra question, but I, I can see there's, there's obviously a temptation. There may be a temptation from investors to push this into a space of being a sort of Airbnb for short term working rentals, including office space. Is your ambition to keep it being something where it's almost like destination, you know, places that are worth going to that create this sort of, you know, well-being and mental health ele- element? Or do you see it like down the line at scale also being maybe people subletting office space per short term lets? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's, it's interesting to see what I mean. So we've started with this single kind of wedge, right, which is like the... um you know, these, where we've identified the biggest market need, right, which is like these, you know, relatively small homes for like individuals, couples, small teams, like get away and do focus work in a world that makes it very hard for them to do so. It's interesting to think about where we kind of um, like expand from that. Like I think ultimately, you know, for us, we want to, you know, it's, it's about differentiating as much as possible, right? And I think, because I think realistically, when you really talk to our users, we're not selling a home, we're selling like, um, you know, we're selling like a chance to get away and work on something, whether it's mm-hmm. like your, you know, your plan for your startup for the year ahead, whether it's, um, you know, like, to, you know, like a new sub stack, whether it's, you know, like a plan for a new podcast series, right? That's kind of really what we're selling. So the more we can lean into that, the better, I think. And so, you know, it's, you know, and, and that involves, I think, focusing a lot on the actual experience itself. So, helping people to do great work when they're away and leaning into that, I think, rather than sort of like, you know, um, here's a home, off you go, right, you know, have a go with it. I think for us, what's really important is like, um, you know, treating these moments as like experiences for people to kind of, okay, I'm aware, I'm, I've stepped away, I can now focus on that thing I've just been desperate to focus on for the last six months. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then finally, final question is to say, parking a shore to one side, if I gave you, made you, Alad, McLean Jones, the, the the minister for the future of work in the UK, but let's don't limit yourself ideologically to the, to the UK, what would you be pushing as an agenda? Because presumably there are, a shore has exposed you to the myriad issues facing the modern worker. And, and what do you think are the big things that you would want to encourage? You know, not this is not crystal ball gazing, this is probably the world of work will not go where we want it to go. But what would you want to encourage? Yeah, so I think there's a few things that like are interesting to me. And I'll start from a UK angle and maybe like become like slightly less sort of like parochial as thing as like as like the answer goes on. Sure. However I mean, so, you want to do it. Yeah, yeah. So I think like firstly, you know, I think that there's you know, as as kind of like as as we see, you know, AI and automation disrupt, but also like um, you know, just the fact that people are able to kind of work across different geographies like if we were to say like the line between geography and like work is broken in a way that it certainly wasn't you know 20 years ago then I think there's obviously like a big opportunity for the UK because you know um as as a place to kind of like live and work like despite whatever you know whatever like you know all of the kind of issues with it as well like generally you know it's it's you know a, a very nice place to be uh you know it's it's very well connected right across the world you've got a great city um you know great kind of major world city in london but also some great cities across the board language is great um you know you've got like a relatively stable kind of rule of law and so on and so forth and so i think there's a really big opportunity for the uk to kind of like almost be um, i'm going to sound like don cummings now but like kind of like knowledge island you know we're basically like with this with this group you know with it with this kind of place basically for people to you know, to come, right, and um, and kind of do great work, right? And so I think this, you know, that's what, how, how could we encourage those people to come here is a big, is a big thing for me. But then also on the defensive, right, how do we kind of make sure that like, you know, like white collar jobs are like not massively disrupted, right? Because the UK is, it's, it's a services economy. And so I think, you know, I'd be very worried about that kind of ebbing, ebbing away from us, right? Because that's a big jewel. That's kind of the the one bit of the UK's economic engine that actually works pretty well. So I think you have to be defensive as well about it. I think there's that. And then I think, um, yeah, and I think then just thinking about, you know, I'm a massive skeptic about like almost everything, but like, you know, on AI, I think I am pretty convinced now about the impact that's going to have on the, on the labor market. Um, and I think that, you know, being being sort of front facing on that as well, I think is key. And I think it's definitely a job for 
whoever wins the next general election, where, whenever it may, whenever it may be, because well, you're you're a natural politician, Alan, because you're being front facing. This is not this is not policy. This is just this is just positioning. What does being front facing on AI mean? Yeah, it's, no, it's 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 a, it's it's a good question because it's also hard, isn't it? Because at the moment, it's too soon to tell, right? As to as to what's going to happen in terms of like. Is this going to be like one of those like labor market disruptions where more jobs are created, or is it one that's going to be where 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 less where less jobs are cre- where less jobs are created, right? Um, and so I, I mean, ultimately, like again, I'm a second politician, but it probably goes back to some kind of some sort of offer on education, basically. Um, but I I wouldn't want to fetch that out, basically. And I I've, I've still got I still got a little bit too much treasury treasury brain to like. Uh, there's something inside me about kind of in my head. I'm always thinking about costings on things, so I'd be like, okay, yeah, I think um, some kind of, uh, yeah, I think that I, I just, I just think just like a lot of government is like just not throwing elbows, you know, and like it's like getting at like not doing stupid stuff. To paraphrase Barack Obama, right? And I think you could do a lot of stupid stuff around this stuff, and so maybe a lot. Like I genuinely, I think often the best thing we can do is just as a government is just like is just sort of you know be thoughtful about it but not not sort of come straight to solutions too quickly you've been listening to the Ned Light radio hour which is a podo podcast and you've made it to the end so well done thanks for that it's written and presented by me nick hilton the music is internet song by h of the state and the artwork is by tom humberston for all queries thoughts whatever you want go to podopods.com p-o-d-o-t pods.com see you next week I'll tell you all some stories of what life was like before the internet. Wandered round our neighborhoods aimlessly, lighting shit.